You're listening to a message preached from the pulpit of the Bible Baptist Church, St. Thomas, Ontario. Take your Bibles with me this morning, if you would, and turn to 2 Chronicles. 2 Chronicles. Second Chronicles, chapter 19, if you will. Second Chronicles, chapter 19. I have a question for you this morning, and uh, I guess you don't necessarily have to answer it out loud, but if you can just get your thinking caps on and think about it a little bit. Success. I want you to think about success. What is success? Think about what success is in your life. Um, For some, it may be to pay off your bills. That might be your success. I'd like that. Success, all right? We all have a definition of success. Some of us may think that it's to be the CEO of a Fortune 500 company. That would be pretty awesome as well, all right? That would be a successful person. Um, Some people would think that success would be a happy marriage, Okay. Also, that is success. I think that would be a great thing. And um, also to raise good kids if you want to be successful with your kids. Um, if some of you might think to get the next promotion in your job, you would be a successful person. Um, some of you um, might think success is living in your dream home. And I have a picture of my dream home in my head right now. And I think that would be pretty awesome as well. Um, some of you might think that success, um, it really... There's countless possibilities of what we think success is. And today, my goal is not to to define success for you. I just want you to begin thinking about success and thinking where success and what success is for you. All of us, every one of us, I believe, if if you're not in this category, there's probably something wrong with you. I think all of us want to succeed in anything that we do in absolutely anything we do. If we didn't want to succeed, we probably wouldn't do them. Let me just give you a couple of examples. Video games. If I didn't want to succeed in video games, I probably wouldn't play them. In fact, I don't, so that's why I don't play them, because I don't really care if I succeed in video games or not. But those of you that do play video games, usually on the lower portion or front portion of our auditorium this morning, those of you that do play video games, you want to succeed in them. If you can't beat a video game, you get very frustrated with it, and you probably stop playing it. You want to succeed. Grocery shopping. If you don't succeed in grocery shopping, which is going to the store, buying the groceries that you need, if you don't succeed in that, you're going to stop grocery shopping, and you're just going to go to Wendy's. Okay? All, everything, I mean, take the minutest thing in your life. If you don't succeed at it, you're going to stop doing it. Success is an amazing thing, and we all want success. But success of any sort, whether it's a CEO of a Fortune 500 company, whether it's paying off your debt, whether it's your home, whether it's your children, whether it's your marriage, no matter what it is, success takes preparation every single time. You don't just wake up one morning and think, today I'm the CEO of a Fortune 500 company, and there it is. It doesn't happen that way. It absolutely, if it did, all of us would be CEOs of Fortune 500 companies. We'd all be raking in the dough. We'd all have so much money that we wouldn't know what to do with. But that's not how it works. Success takes preparation. To have a good marriage takes preparation. To raise good children takes preparation. To pay off your debt takes preparation. By the way, it takes taking a Dave Ramsey course. That was just a plug for Dave Ramsey, all right? You don't have to take Dave Ramsey's course to be successful. You don't just wake up. It takes preparation. Preparation always precedes success. And I really want you to begin to think about that and what you must prepare to do. If I'm going to build a house, I must prepare to build a house. I must dig the hole that the foundation has to go in. That's preparing for building a house. Then I must lay the foundation I cannot build a house, or I should not build a house, unless there's a foundation. It all has to start somewhere. Preparation is key. Now, I think about the parable of the sower in the seed, which is found in Luke chapter 8. You don't have to turn there. 
But I think about the parable of the sower and the seed. And there's soil all involved in there. There's four types of soil. There's the wayside. There's the stony or the rocky ground. There's the thorny ground. And then there's the good soil. And I began to think about that. How did the soil become good? The soil is good in the, in the last part. And the Bible says that it brings forth fruit. And it produces fruit. And all these good things. So how did the soil become good? Did it just happen that way? Did it just wake up one morning and it's good? I, I doubt it. How did the soil become good? Is there something that we can do to improve the soil? I love farming. I spent 10 years of my life farming, and I enjoyed it thoroughly. My favorite, really, the part of the year was planting season. And we would get going on planting, and it was actually crazy. It was nuts. And just we had to get things going as fast as possible because weather permitting, we had to get everything in that we needed to get in. And, and we just would go, go to town really and really rush around trying to get things going. One of my jobs was spreading fertilizer. Now, before you think you gross, it wasn't manure, okay? It was just lime fertilizer mixed with a bunch of other things. But in order to spread that fertilizer, what we did is we went out and we took what's called a soil sample. And we would take some dirt from the fields all over the place that we did, and we would send those in to be analyzed. And then we would tell them what crop we wanted to plant in that field, whether it was beans or corn. Those were basically the ones that we did. We did some wheat. And we would send that and be analyzed, and we would say, this is what we want to plant in that field. And they would send back to us exactly what that soil needed to best grow that type of crop. So a lot of times, most of it was lime. There were some other things that we put in there, like I said before. We wanted to do all we could to get the soil as good as possible so that when the seed was planted, it could grow to its fullest potential. We didn't want to plant corn that would only grow knee-high. That's it. We wanted to plant corn that would grow knee-high by the 1st of July and that it would continue to grow until September, October, October, November, and even into December sometimes. We wanted that corn to grow to its fullest extent. So we went and we took soil samples. And so my challenge to you this morning is I want you to take a soil sample. I, wanna, I want you to understand where is your heart? What type of soil is your heart? What type of, uh, uh, is it a good soil? Is it a thorny soil? Is it a stony soil? Or is it on the wayside? I want you to look at your heart right now. I want you to think about this right now. I don't want you to think about this tomorrow. I want you to think about right now. What type of soil are you? If you're the wayside, you hear the word of God. But you allow the devil, you allow the devil to take that, that seed of the word of God away. And it doesn't bring forth fruit. It doesn't take root. It doesn't do anything. If you're a rocky soil, you hear the word of God and you actually receive it. But you don't allow it to take root because the rocks are there. And it never makes a difference. It actually doesn't grow. It just dries up and withers away from the sun. If you're the thorny ground, you hear the word of God. You even receive it. And you allow it to grow, but you allow other things to grow alongside of it. You allow other things to grow up with it. And it robs the nutrients from the thing that God is trying to do. And it strangles the word of God in your life. And if... I hope majority of you would say, I'm good soil. I'm somebody that hears the word of God. I receive it, and it grows properly, and it produces fruit. What kind of soil are you? I want you to seriously think about that right now. And I believe all of us know what kind of soil we are. I don't really think we need some great preaching to tell us what kind of soil we are. I think we all know. And I would hope that all of us are good soil, but I believe there is something in our heart, if your heart is anything but good, then there is something you can do about it. Second Chronicles chapter 2, or chapter 19, verse 1. Talking about a king of Jehoshaphat. Verse 2, and Jehu, the son of Hanani, the seer, went to meet him and said to King Jehoshaphat, shouldest thou help the ungodly and love them that hate the Lord? Therefore is wrath upon thee from before the Lord. So he's doing things that are wrong. The wrath is upon him. Verse 3, nevertheless, this prophet says, there are good things found in thee. 
in that thou hast taken away the groves out of the land and hast prepared thine heart to seek God. This is very key, and I want you to understand this. This king was not doing right, but he did do some right in that he prepared his heart. He took out the groves and prepared his heart to seek after God. So there is an opportunity for you to prepare your heart. Opportunity to change the type of soil. And pastors preach the message on altars, images, and groves. A very good message. I don't want to re-preach that. But the fact of the matter is, this guy did do some right. He did start to prepare his heart. But I want you to go to chapter 20 and verse 30. Chapter 20 and verse 30. The Bible says, So the realm of Jehoshaphat was quiet, for his God gave him rest round about. So he's, the Lord has really blessed him here. Verse 31, and Jehoshaphat reigned over Judah. He was 30 and 5 years old when he began to reign. And he reigned 20 and 5 years in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was Azubah, the daughter of Shilhai. And he walked in the way of Asa, his father, which is a good thing. Asa was a good man. And departed not from it, doing that which was right in the sight of the Lord. Now watch this, verse 33. How be it, the high places were not taken away. Now watch. For as yet... The people had not prepared their hearts unto the God of their fathers. And what I want to show you is there's two different things you can do. You can prepare your heart to seek after God, or you cannot prepare your heart to seek after God. I'm guaranteeing you, if you will prepare your heart, you will see success. If you do not prepare your heart, you will not see success. Those are the two options that you have, and nobody can force you to do any of those things. But there are two options, to prepare your heart. You see, I am responsible for my heart. I am responsible for the way that I prepare it. Proverbs chapter 4 and verse 23 says, Keep thy heart with all diligence. Why? For out of it are the issues of life. Keep your heart with all diligence. That word keep from Strong's Dictionary means to guard or to protect, or to maintain. Think about this. Think about your heart as soil. You guard it. You protect it. You keep anything out of there that doesn't need to be in there. You you maintain it. You put fertilizer on it. You, You make it as good as you can. It's our responsibility. It is your responsibility for your heart. It is my responsibility for my heart. So the question is, how do I prepare the soil? How do I prepare my heart so that God can do the work of giving the increase? By the way, it's God that gives the increase. I think about soil, and I think about corn. And I told you, we would go through and we would, we would get as much planted in a short amount of time as we could. And we would go crazy. We'd work long days. We'd be, we'd be running back and forth, and as fast as we could, we'd be fueling up tractors and trying to get them back out there and just going, going nuts, really. And as soon as that week or a little over a week was over that we planted, we would basically, it would calm down. Why? Because our job was over. The increase came from God. The increase came from God's structure of how plants grow, and I won't get into the science of it all, but God gives the increase. We had to prepare the soil. It's our job. It's my job to prepare the soil, but how do I do that? It is my opinion that we don't see the increase of God Because we have not prepared our soil. The Lord's work in our lives cannot grow to its fullest potential. And we cannot have success because we've not prepared. And that's my challenge for you today is to prepare your heart. The first thing I want you to see is the picture. The picture. I want you to go to Joel, and I'm positive of this one. Go to Joel chapter 1. Joel. Chapter 1. Joel chapter 1. Joel is a minor prophet. He prophesied in the days of Judah. And he, like most prophets, had a warning. He had something that he wanted to tell the people of Judah. He is proclaiming that warning, and he writes about it. I want you to notice that his warning is to the people of God. It's not to the heathen. It's not to anybody else but the people of God. 
I want you to notice that. In chapter 1 of Joel, he paints for us a picture. And I'm going to actually read the entire chapter, and I want you to see it. The Bible says this, The word of the Lord that came to Joel, the son of Pethuel. Hear this, ye old men, and give ear, all ye inhabitants of the land. Hath this been in your days, or even in the days of your fathers? Tell ye your children of it, and let your children tell their children, and their children another generation. That which the palmer worm hath left, hath the locust eaten. And that which the locust hath left, hath the canker worm eaten. And that which the canker worm hath left, the caterpillar eaten. Awake, ye drunkards, and weep, and howl, all ye drinkers of wine, because of the new wine, for it is cut off from your mouth. For a nation is come up upon my land, strong and without number, whose teeth are the teeth of a lion, and he hath the cheek teeth of a great lion. He hath laid my vine waste, and barked my fig tree, he hath made it clean, bare, and cast it away. The branches thereof are made white. Lament like a virgin girded with sackcloth for the husband of her youth. The meat offering and the drink offering is cut off from the house of the Lord. The priests, the Lord's ministers, mourn. The field is wasted. The land mourneth. For the corn is wasted. The new wine is dried up. The oil languisheth. Be ye ashamed, O ye husbandmen. Howl, O ye vine dressers, for the wheat and for the barley, because the harvest of the field is perished. The vine is dried up, and the fig tree languisheth, the pomegranate tree, the palm tree also, and the apple tree, even of all the trees of the field are withered, because joy is withered away from the sons of men. Gird yourselves and lament, ye priests. Howl, ye ministers of the altar. Come, lie all night in sackcloth, ye ministers of my God. For the meat offering and the drink offering is withholden from the house of your God. Sanctify ye a fast. Call a solemn assembly. Gather the elders and all the inhabitants of the land into the house of the Lord your God. And cry unto the Lord. Alas, for the day. For the day of the Lord is at hand. And as a destruction from the Almighty shall it come. Is not the meat cut off from before your eyes? Our eyes? Yea, joy and gladness from the house of your God. The seed is rotten under their clods. The garners are laid desolate. The barns are broken down, for the corn is withered. How do the beasts groan? The herds of cattle are perplexed. Why? Because they have no pasture. Yea, the flocks of sheep are made desolate. O Lord, to thee will I cry. For the fire hath devoured the pastures of the wilderness, and the flame hath burned all the trees of the field. The beasts of the field cry also unto thee, for the rivers of water are dried up, and the fire hath devoured the pastures of the wilderness. There's a picture here. The picture is this, simply, a barren, burnt wasteland. Something that you can tell used to be a good orchard. I mean, he talks about all the trees. And the wheat and the corn, they're, they're gone. They're burnt up. They're eaten by the canker worm and the palmer worm and the locust and the caterpillar. It's desolate. It's a wasteland. It's no good anymore. Things are actually not good. I can imagine some tumbleweeds rolling through. An old western song playing. The cattle didn't even know what to do. There was no pasture for them. The sheep are desolate, the Bible even says. I can picture the thorns and the bramble all popping up, and there's nothing good in this place. And I can picture myself as a farmer looking over this vast, desolate land and going, oh, wow. What used to be and what could be. See, there's two ways of looking at things. You can look at things as the glass half empty. Or you can look at things as a glass half full. Some people look at a desolate land like that and think, all right, let's see what we can do with this. Let's see if we can rehabilitate this to become the land that it once was. It's going to take a lot of work. It's going to take a lot of things that need to go on. As a kid, I remember my parents, we had a middle section of trees. And if some of the guys have been to my house, there's a middle section of pine trees as you go out to the road past the laneway. And my mom, for some reason, wanted all of that cleaned out. And there's all kinds of weeds, is all they were, but they grew up and were hard, basically little bushes. And so it was my responsibility to go through and clean up that entire piece of the pine trees. 
was a lot of work. And I looked at that and went, ugh, this is going to take forever. And it did. It took a long time, and it was trailer load after trailer load of brush, and it was, it was hard work. And you know what? The interesting thing was, I did all that. The next year, it was all back again. Like, seriously? I just did all that work for nothing. And now my mom says, hey, will you do that again? I said, mom, really? And I like, look at it from last year. She's like, well, I guess you just have to keep up on it this year. But that's the example. That's the example that we're looking for. There's a picture of all of it growing back. Perhaps at one time you were good soil. Perhaps at one time you were preparing your heart to receive the things of the word of God. But now it's desolate. It's burnt. It's dried up. It's hard. Might be a picture of your heart. Perhaps you're hard toward the things of God. Where once you were soft. So how do we begin preparing our heart for God? How do we begin? Well, let me show you, secondly, the process. The process. Uh, Joel chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. Tell us about the judgments that God is going to bring because of their condition. God says he's going to allow some judgment to come because of the condition that these people are in. And so I want to actually jump to verse 12. I want to skip the judgment part of it because I think we understand that when we don't obey God, God sends judgment. But I want to look at verse 12, the process of how to prepare your heart. The Bible says, Therefore also now saith the Lord, Turn ye even to me with all your heart, and watch with fasting, and with weeping, and with mourning, and watch again, and rend your heart, and not your garments. And turn unto the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and repenteth him of the evil. Who knoweth if he will return and repent, and leave a blessing behind him, even a meat offering, and a drink offering unto the Lord your God? Blow the trumpet in Zion, sanctify a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children, and those that suck the breasts, let the, let the bridegroom go forth of his chamber, and the bride out of her closet. Let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep between the porch and the altar, and let them say, spare thy people, O Lord, and give not thine heritage to reproach. That the heathen should rule over them. Wherefore should they say among the people, where is thy God? You want to know the process for getting and preparing your heart? Getting your heart to the place in which it's good ground? The process for preparing our hearts is really found in the text. Fasting. Weeping. Mourning. Breaking up the clods of our heart. Rending our heart. Tearing it to pieces. He says, don't rend your clothes. By the way, that was a practice that they did when they were showing humility. They would rend their clothes. They would put on sackcloth and put ashes on the top of their head and show them, we're in mourning. We're humbling ourselves before Almighty God. He says, I don't want you to do that. I want you to rend your heart. Because it's the heart that matters. It's your heart. It's the preparation of your heart. Clean up the land. Remove the thorns. Spread the fertilizer. Get the ground ready for planting. So exactly what does that equate to in our lives? The process of preparing our heart. First of all, we have to realize the desolation of our heart. You have to see it. You have got... The, the first way to help somebody is they have to recognize their condition. I can't help somebody if they don't understand that there's something wrong. I can't help a marriage if both of them say, there's nothing wrong with our marriage. The first thing that we must do is recognize the desolation. Recognize that our heart may not be in the right spot. May not be as what it should be. Realize that sin is stealing nutrients. Sin is stealing what God is trying to do in your lives. I, don't, I think all of us know what sin is in our life. I'm sure you're thinking of it right now. There's a sin that is stealing nutrients. Realize the distractions that are using our heart instead of God using our heart. Do you know there's things that can rob our attention? Not necessarily bad things. Distractions. 
And Satan is very good at using distractions that rob our hearts from what God is trying to do. Realize the place that we give Satan in our heart. We often do that. But once you've realized all of these things, you must realize them. Once you realize them, you must do something about it. You can't just realize it and say, oh man, that stinks, and just turn around and walk the other way. You must do something about it to prepare your heart. Begin removing the sins out of your life. Begin saying, no, if sinners entice thee, consent thou not. Say, no, no, no. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to have it. I'm not going to give Satan place in my life. I'm not going to let him have a foothold in my life. Say, no, keep sin out of your life. Remove it. Begin resisting the devil. The Bible says, resist the devil and he will what? Flee. Resist the devil. Start. Don't give him place in your life. Don't let him rob the word of God out of your life. Resist the devil. Don't be entangled with the affairs of this life. Get those distractions out of there. No man that warreth entangleth himself in the affairs of this life. If you're going to war, you can't be entangled and trapped with the thorns, the distractions, the cares of this life. Get those things out of there. The Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 7, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. And some of you might say, that's a pretty hard thing to do. I absolutely agree with you. But if we're to prepare our soil properly, that's what we have to do. Cast those things out. Get them out. Don't be entangled with the affairs of this life. By the way, all of these things that I just mentioned, we have allowed every one of them into our lives. We have. Nobody's forced them on us. Nobody's done, held a gun to our head and said, you are going to do this sin. Nobody's held a gun to our head and said, you're going to be distracted by your computer this week so you won't spend time with God. We have allowed them. So it's our responsibility to remove them. Get them out of there. Don't let them in there anymore. We are the ones who must remove them. Go to 2 Timothy chapter 2. In verse 20. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 20. Second Timothy chapter 2 and verse 20, the Bible says this, But in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, and some to honor and some to dishonor. And I hope you're like me when you go have somebody come to your house. I have some glasses and different things that I would give you rather than my old coffee mugs. There's some that are for honor, and some that you just use every day, for dishonor even, some that you actually throw away. But I want you to look at verse 21. Now watch. If a man therefore purge himself from these, that purging means to remove any bad. Purge, or if you will, in the the vernacular, get rid of from these. He shall be, watch, a vessel unto honor, sanctified or separated, and meet, watch, for the master's use. See, we have a responsibility to purge ourselves, to get rid of the junk that's on our vessel. Clean it up. Get right with God. Turn our hearts to God and say, God, please, I want to be used of you. I want to be meat for your use. Now watch the end of the verse. And what? Prepared unto every good work. See, far too often we're not prepared for every good work because we haven't purged ourselves. We haven't cleaned up our heart. We haven't gotten the stuff out. We haven't gotten the sin out. We haven't gotten the distractions out. We haven't resisted the devil. We just let him run rampant in our lives. I'm not saying we're the most dirty, rotten sinners of all time. I'm not trying to say that. What I am trying to say is I don't think we spend enough time preparing our heart. We don't spend enough time on the soil because, folks, again, the foundation, if your foundation's not right, Nothing else is going to be right. It'll all be crooked. It'll all be falling down. And sometimes we live that defeated life, I believe, because we don't prepare our hearts. Do you want to be prepared for the thing that God wants to use you for? Is that something you want, or are you just satisfied with the status quo? Are you satisfied with where you're at right now in your life, or do you want to be more for Christ? Do you want to be something that God can say, yes, 
This is an honorable vessel. I can use this vessel. I can use this man. I can use this woman for my honor and my glory. Why? Because he purged himself and he's prepared unto every good work. Now, to be honest with you, removing is not the end. You can remove everything that you want. That's a great thing. The Bible says to put off the old man. But there's something else you have to do. You have to put on the new man. It must be replaced with something. If you remove thorns, you have to replace it with something. Replace it. That something is the seed of the word of God. If I'm going to replace something, I need to plant something in its place. I need to put the word of God in its place. If I'm going to remove distractions, I can't just sit there idly. Because next thing I know, I'll be right back into those distractions. You see, so often we put off the old man. We forget to renew our mind and put on the new man, which the Bible says is created after the image of him that created us. It's after God. We need to spend time in the word of God. I know it's important to read your Bible every day. And I know we get that preached at us all the time. But in order to remove the things that we need to remove and to plant the things that we need to plant, we need to be in the word of God. And I'm not talking five minutes a day. I'm talking about planting. I don't plant one seed every week by coming to church once a week. That would be ridiculous. A farmer would be laughed to scorn if he put one seed in a week. But we think that's okay in our spiritual life. We think it's okay to even once a day read our Bibles. Now, I know, I know we're busy. I'm talking about preparing our heart for God to do something great. I'm talking about not just sticking with the status quo. I'm talking about taking it to the next level. Because you might be a thorny ground and something is growing and you are producing a little bit of fruit, but it never reaches perfection. Look at Luke chapter 8. That's exactly what the thorny ground did. But I'm talking about getting rid of those thorns and getting to the point where we can produce fruit. Some 30-fold, some 60-fold, some 100-fold. And seeing God do something absolutely miraculous, not because of really what we've done, but just simply because we prepared our hearts. Prepared our hearts for something that God can do. We are to keep the things out that need to be taken out, and we need to keep the things in that need to be kept in. We need to keep our heart. A heart that is prepared to seek the Lord will see something amazing. And I want to show you thirdly, the pouring. The pouring. Go to Joel. Back to Joel, please. Chapter 2. Joel chapter 2. Look at verse 27. Where we stopped reading, the next several verses show that the blessing of God would disperse upon his people. And again, I I think we can assume and remember that when we obey God and when we turn our hearts to God, God will bless us. God will give us blessing. But I want to go beyond that. I want you to see exactly what God can accomplish with a heart that's prepared the right way. Look at verse 27. The Bible says this, And ye shall know that I am in the midst of Israel. And that I am the Lord your God, and none else, and my people shall never be ashamed. Verse 28. And it shall come to pass afterward, after all this happens, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your old men shall see dream dreams, Your young men shall see visions, and also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit. And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great day and the terrible day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance, as the Lord has said, and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. I don't know about you, but I have prayed, God, pour out your spirit. 
Let us see an outpouring of the Spirit upon this place. Could it be that he says no? Because our hearts aren't prepared. Because we haven't turned our heart to God. Because we haven't removed and we don't have the good soil and our heart is hard or stony or or thorny. Could it be? Because right here, Right here, the Bible says afterward, after we do, after we get right with God, after we fast and mourn and weep and realize that, hey, we messed up. I have allowed these things into my life. After we do that, he says afterward, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. All flesh. This is my personal opinion. Take it for what you will. It's not God's problem or God's doing that he doesn't pour out his spirit. It's ours. It's ours. We're not what we should be, and I I can be the first to tell you that. I'm not. And I'm humbled today. But the great thing is we can see a real-life example of this. Go to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. If you know anything about the book of Acts, Acts chapter 1, Jesus is still here. Jesus gives his disciples one last great commission and says, you need to go out into all the world. Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. The rest of Acts chapter 1, we see preparation. Jesus' ascension, he goes into heaven. The disciples meet in an upper room and the Bible says that they continue in prayer and supplication. Hello? Hello? Prayer and supplication, that's a good thing. It's a good thing to continue in those things. And meeting with all in one accord, the Bible says, in this upper room. We see at the end of Acts chapter 1 that they appoint another apostle. Peter gets up and stands up and says, hey, we need to appoint another apostle. This is what God wanted us to do. Then we go into chapter 2. Chapter 2, in verse 1, the Bible says, And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it sat upon each of them. Watch. Verse 4. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them other and now I'm not here to tell you that we need it we when we're filled with the spirit we're going to speak in tongues I'm not getting into that but the fact of the matter is they were filled with the spirit now watch continue on throughout the chapter verse 5 through 13 they speak in tongues by the power of the holy spirit and many are confounded by this that it could happen and some even said these guys are drunk they don't how can they do this they're just drunk look at verse 14 The Bible says this, But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea, and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken to my words. For these are not drunken, as ye suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet who? Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out of my Spirit upon all flesh, And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams, and on my servants and on my handmaids will I pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy, and I will show wonders in heaven above, and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke, the sun shall be turned into darkness, and the moon into blood before that great day and notable day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. We look at Acts, I I look at Acts and just go, wow, wouldn't it be amazing to live in those days? Wouldn't it be amazing to see the outpouring of the Spirit? Maybe I'm dumb, maybe I'm naive, but I personally think it can be done. I think God can pour out his spirit. I think God will pour out his spirit. But somewhere down the line, somehow, some way, we forgot to prepare our heart for it. We've begged God for it, no doubt about it. I've begged God for it. 
But I believe we've forgotten to prepare the soil. Prepare what God is trying to do. Perhaps we've not noticed the things that have crept into our lives. That's easy enough. Things move in slowly. Perhaps we have allowed some things, though not inherently bad, but we've allowed them to distract us and entangle us. Perhaps you might even be thinking this. Pastor Yeomans, my ground is good. I know it's good. Would you then, like David, in Psalm chapter 139 say, Search me, O God, and know my heart, and see if there be any wicked way in me. Because there are times when in my pride I thought, well, I'm, I'm pretty good. And David was a man after God's own heart. And he realized that God had to search him. Today, will you, with me, claim the promises of 2 Chronicles chapter 7, and verse 14, which says, If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked way, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and will hear their land. Folks, Hosea chapter 10 and verse 12, break up your fallow ground. Break it up. Why? It's time to seek the Lord. It's time. I don't want to stick with the status quo anymore. I don't want to stick with just going through the motions and maybe it is that God is done with us. Maybe that's the case. But I want to do all I can. I want to put, I want to take every soil sample I can of every corner of my heart and say, God, what does this corner need? And send it off for analysis. And God says, this is what you need. Remove that from the soil. Add that to the soil. Add the word of God here. Fertilize it there. Will you join with me? and preparing our hearts to seek after God. It's, not, it's only a decision I can make for myself, but I don't want to do, I don't want to play church anymore. I want to see God do something great, and I think it's my responsibility to seek and break up because it's time to seek the Lord. Let's pray. We trust you've enjoyed this message preached at the Bible Baptist Church of St. Thomas, Ontario, pastored by Dr. Al Stone. We invite you to be a part of our worship service this Sunday 